Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Great help inside of here as well. So, uh, this is actually our office at Comis. We started here about two years ago for marketing with a little uh, reporting tool. And I don't know, we started out with more dynamic display advertising. We started to serve HTML5 banners, which is kind of new at the time because most people were using Flash. And uh, well, more and more apps were introduced, and after a while it was like, well, this is not very practical, we need to start up servers every time, and it takes a lot of time every time, so we need to uh, kind of like improve this, and it have to be one of the efforts hobbies to actually automate this, and uh, he had a whole journey from where we started out, from the things we needed, to where we are right now, which is almost there, and uh, this is the story that's what we're going to tell right now, so. Thank you. Well, yes, let's jump right into it. I know this is a meetup about continuous delivery and continuous integration, so I will end there. But before we are there, there is a whole journey that we have to take, otherwise, uh, yeah, before we are there. So let's quickly jump to it. First, I will talk a bit about uh, digital advertising. What is it? Uh, and which kinds of uh, technical problems do you, uh, do you uh, have to, to, to solve and how can we challenge that? And I, I will uh, elaborate on the previous uh, situation, like about already uh, mentioned. And then I will uh, continue with the solution. Um, so, what is what is the area of digital advertising? Well, it has something to do with real-time bidding. Um, I'm just curious, who of you guys knows what real-time bidding is? Ah, cool. Who of you guys works more or less in the digital advertising industry? <laughs> Not so much. Used to. Okay. So you know how it works then. Um, for the guys and then the, the girls that don't know how it works, it is uh, actually basically every time I go to to a website, for example, a new uh, there are like uh, six uh, advertisement blocks, and for all these blocks separately, there is an auction, and that's started and is finished within 100 milliseconds. And based on your cookies and your cookie profiling information, we are going to serve you the right ad, or at least that's of course what we try to do. So uh, that means, from, from an IT perspective, that there are a lot of transactions and there needs to be a lot of customization. So uh, based on the specific consumer, you need to customize your app. And that's difficult, that's challenging. Um, so like, you, like it says over there, we are only just getting started, so 250 million uh, ads per month. It's not that much, but still, we, you have to think of a solution. Um, so it's, it's real-time bidding. It's just the same as the, the auction for flowers that you have in Osmere. That's this picture, way back, but now done by computers. Um, and there are some, uh, you said it, there are some players in this field. Uh, and well, the slide is in Russian because for most people it is Russian. Speaking <laughs> 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 uh, people here. So what it says, uh, you have uh, DSPs and SSPs. Uh, the SSP basically communicates with uh, the publisher website, so that's new.nl, Foxconn.nl, etc. all these publishers. That's the supply side platform, so that's the one on the left. And the demand side platform, that's where all the intelligence is. Uh, those guys, they have uh, really nice big data algorithms and machine learning technologies to make sure that you guys here get the right ad. Well, if you don't have an ad blocker, which... Let's say that you don't have that, then you will... Um, then you will be served with an advertisement that really fits your personal situation. So uh, your your gender, your city, more or less roughly those, uh, based on those things. Okay, where do we come in? So I told about the demand side platform that's over here. We are not a demand side platform. At Combi is not a demand side platform. Uh, we are after that, so we try to customize the, um, the advertisement. And this is for us, uh, data and IT geeks. This is of course the cool stuff. This is for one impression, all the data that you get. So it's quite a lot. And we have to, um, mm -hmm. we have to store that and we have to serve it quite rapidly. Okay, so now the, the problem. Um, previously, I did it all by hand. So uh, you heard before that you should use Ansible scripts and you should use all these uh, things to automate it and you should uh, see your whole infrastructure as code so it, it should be immutable you could just delete it and get it back up but I didn't know that two years back <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and we didn't have a lot of money so then I decided to choose a few of those low-end uh, virtual uh, private server providers that it's the ocean maybe you've heard of them and some other ones and some better proven technology so that's where we started and we wanted a short time to market and we uh, my colleague Wouter and, and myself we were quite handy with Ruby on Rails and that goes quick. So let's jump right into it. But then, 
after a half a year, I discovered that I was spending, let's say, two or three days, three days a week to build a server. Then we do a campaign, a lot of people, a lot of traffic, blah, 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 really good, awesome. And then one month later, no campaign anymore, so too much cost, so I have to destroy the server again, or at least that, that's what in the ideal world we would like to do. So uh, then I came up with a, um, a solution, and I will jump into that uh, a few seconds later. But this is how it used to be for, let's say, one and a half years. So quite simple. You have your uh, DNS, and you have three separate data centers, simple, battle-proven, uh, Nginx resource proxies, and your application servers uh, underneath. And this, this works really good. But then the digital advertisement industry has a traffic curve like this. So this is uh, midnight, and this is midnight again. So it goes like this, nothing, nothing, nothing. Then everybody wakes up all of a sudden. And then, uh, then everybody needs to go to work. And then lunch, <laughs> and then in the evening, even bigger. So the whole thing is that if you want to, uh, well, if you want to adapt to that, then you need to spin up your servers uh, during the day with different uh, type of services. Okay, so now that's the challenge. This challenge, I didn't know how to fix it. But it's also, we also need states. We also need to, st to store our data somewhere and choose for two databases with, uh, that have uh, REST uh, interfaces, at least uh, the right one has and the left one yeah, also. And we use the engineering reverse proxies to do some uh, credential thingies. So it's all really basic to this point. But then I had a problem, and the problem was, like I said, I don't want to be this guy. I don't <laughs> want to be the sysadmin guy. <laughs> yeah. Because then we were only with two guys, maybe three by then, three or four, but no, I, I think three. So that means that there was not enough resources to do all this stuff. So I have to be, I had to be smarter than that. And then I tried this because, of course, I read something like most of you guys probably also read stuff on the internet about Docker and yeah. containers and stuff. And it sounded all really fancy. And this sounded really fancy to me because then I have a ship or a server with all these small blocks in it. And I was thinking, okay, let's put all the problems that we have in containers. And then there are no problems anymore because then we can just open <laughs> it up and, 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 and tear it back, yeah, back down. Okay, but that was dream yeah, dream on. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, so um, for the guys uh, that don't know Kubernetes that well, um, this is a schematic overview of the components that I used. So Docker is where all the applications live. Um, we use Flannel. That's an overlay network. So between multiple physical nodes, there is communication. Uh, between the nodes, that's that's normal. But now, it, now there it is. Flannel can also make it possible that Docker container one on host A can communicate with Docker container three hundred on host C, for example, and they can just talk to each other like they are in the same subnet, which is not, by definition, should it not, it's not always true. Uh, in in our case, we had three data centers, so they were even separated all over the globe. So that's what we use this component for. And Kubernetes, that's actually a really intelligent, yeah. It is an intelligent scheduler. So that's, um, uh, it, it, it says, you say to Kubernetes, okay, I want five um, times this application up and running, no matter what. So it's now up to you. So then, for example, one goes down, and Kubernetes spins uh, one back up until there are five again. So it's really full tolerant, so I don't get called in the night anymore. So this was all sounded really good. And we use this component, etc. D. It's really simple. It's like console, maybe you've heard of it. It's, it's a key value store. But then it is really smart in distributing all these keys and values over multiple services. Okay, okay so we can continue. This is how the dashboard looks. So it's, it has these awesome uh, specs. Okay, that much CPU is used, and there there's a lot of memory. So the thing is super intelligent. So if you spin up an application which, which uses a lot of memory, then it's obviously it's not go going to go spin up here, but somewhere else. Okay, now we are at the continuous integration bit where you guys all came for, because that was also a, a thing that we have to uh, solve. Uh, I know I knew back then I knew about Jenkins, but I also was a little bit scared about the, the complexity. Maybe I was wrong, but at the moment it, it looked like hmm, maybe a little bit uh, too ugly. much stuff to configure. Sorry, a little bit ugly. And it was <laughs> the, yeah, it was <laughs> not ugly. So, yeah, so, so I, I, uh, I was looking into some other solutions, and that's why I want to talk about now. Um, I tried to implement it to, to fix our problems with uh, GitLab CI. So GitLab, uh, as you all know, is a, some kind of an open source um, alternative to GitLab, and they have GitHub. They have GitHub. GitHub. Oh, sorry, sorry. 
and they built a really nice continuous integration uh, tool, which is it is quite basic, but I will I will do a quick demonstration to show to you guys how we implement it. Uh, so I'm try i okay. I don't work here anymore, so I will do an update. Unless uh, <laughs> guys here say to me that I cannot do an update. <laughs> but uh, well, I don't hear any objection, so uh, I will just continue. Uh, where is the Guys, this is a surface that we have. It's just an API. I will make the screen bigger. Hello. Yeah. So it's great. It's some kind of Ruby framework. For now, it's not important. But you can see here that uh, I I implemented a, a teapot um, REST call. So if you can, if you call slash teapot, it will return with the 480 uh, April Fool's Day uh, status code. So uh, let me first demonstrate that I'm not lying to you, so I will show to you guys. Uh, oops. That's on the other side. Yeah, I know, I have to. I'm going to tell to my computer that it should be one display. Command of one. Okay. Uh, so here it is. This is, uh, at this point, this is listening to, oh, where is it? See this service? Okay, you should. I will kill it. <laughs> Put this. I look, love look. It. Now it fails, so I'm not lying to you. I'm starting it again. Okay. Yeah, it started. Explore. And now this lists all the things that this API can do. So it can do well, a lot of awesome stuff. Uh, but you never, you, no, you don't see teapot here, right? So no teapot. Okay, now let's go back to the code. <laughs> And that's quickly. Teapot? Teapot is my favorite uh, status code. No? Mm. Like it actually is a status code. It, it is. Look it up. Yeah. 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 Okay, there it goes. Teapot. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so now it, is, uh, it has something teapot and it's an intentional error and somewhere here, <laughs> 480. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to. Um, push this, try to push this into production. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think I can uh, commit this. Great. <laughs> this <Sorry. one. laughs> okay, I will, I will commit this and I will now quickly go back <coughs> to the GitLab mm -hmm. uh, environment where this project lives. So this is the project, it's called Campaign Manager Backend. And you see that I committed something less than a minute ago, and now the build is running. So the build. This is I didn't I didn't prepare this guy, so I hope it does something good. But it's still, it's still uh, running. That's that's a good thing. So what you see here is uh, a Docker container is being built by GitLab CI. So uh, <coughs> I defined uh, just like uh, you do in Jenkins, I just defined a few rules. Uh, your container should have Ruby installed. Your container should have. Uh, some kind of an XML parser and uh, maybe some other dependencies installed. And then, uh, well, when I do the commit, this is happening. And this is going to take four or three minutes. So, okay, I will go back and I will show you how the results, of the result of a build before, how it looks. So in the end, um, up to this point, the container <coughs> is zoomed. Yeah, thank you very much. So you say, okay, now it's successfully built a container, and after that, it's going to push the Docker container container into a, a private registry that we have. And the image you mean? Sorry. The image you mean? Yeah. Thank, so, yeah. Sorry. It's the image, not the <laughs> container. Yeah. Good one. I keep mixing those those, those those things up. So it's pushing the image into a private Docker registry, and afterwards, uh, or at least that's the idea, it should be um, discovered by <coughs> Kubernetes. And so back to the slides. And then it should be it should be picked up by the system, and it should be uh, brought to to production environment. But but then uh, I left. So <laughs> 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 okay, sorry, but I, I didn't uh, complete it. I, I had this in production for a week or something to to try and test with it. So it was actually some kind of a shadow IP production thingy. <coughs> but uh, we need uh, guys uh, to fix this and to 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 uh, conclude this. And actually, I am now asking you guys, maybe you have some suggestions for the last missing link. 
to get a Docker image out of the Docker registry into Kubernetes or into some other intelligent scheduler if you have better uh, alternative alternatives. So if there are IDs, please let me know now. Uh, yes, 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 <laughs> yes. I can show you. But I, I have, have a couple of suggestions. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> You're showing a very old dashboard of Kubernetes, by the way. <laughs> it's just been superseded four months ago by a new one. But uh, yeah, so what is your problem exactly? You have containers put, put up in the registry, right? Yeah, I have containers put up in the registry. And to launch the container, <laughs> Yeah, images. 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 Well, you can see it. They're containers because actually there's the binary snapshots and they just continue running. So <laughs> it's equal. It just starts running and it's dead until it starts running. So it's just the same binary. It doesn't matter. But, but, but so the, to start it up, we of course need some environment variables and like a 10 inch exactly. or something like that. And uh, that's the thing that we didn't uh, figure out yet to make it really handy and really smooth, smooth experience to click through it. Um, so of course there is uh, value storage like console, we could have, should have maybe looked into that. But at this point we just use a Docker Compose uh, file, a YAML file with all yeah. environment variables. And I go with SSA, the old fashioned way, I go to a server, which by the way is now way more easy to, to deploy because I can just use Terraform to build a server with Docker host installed, yep. make a Docker console file and boot up the Docker image, and then it becomes a Docker container, uh, and, and it works. So that works perfectly. But it's still, yeah. it's not perfect yet. We need to do it. I think this is just a lack of um, knowledge that you have about yeah. uh, the recent development of Kubernetes, actually. Mm -hmm. Because what we're talking about, in essence, is um, we have applications, but we want to wire them together with configuration. And uh, if you're from infrastructure, we know that infrastructure is the hardest thing to automate. <laughs> and, you know, I mean configuration. And so um, Kubernetes came up with a solution. First, um, came up with a solution to uh, store credentials and secure and uh, secure information. And uh, so it used um, some, what was the name again for that? Secrets. Secrets. It used secrets for that. It was, were just base 64 encoded strings that you could put into a um, that's it, into a, a side registry that was a, it's just a container that runs on, on the Kubernetes platform, which, ha which holds all the secrets that you um, want to expose to other containers. So you don't have to build them into the containers. You can keep the secret stuff out. And so they s suddenly decided, like, after a while, they saw, like, well, we need the same mechanism actually also for, for configuration. So you, know, you want your containers to be done. We don't want them to know anything about the outside world, you know, ultimately. So um, they decided we'll have, we'll create a configuration component. And this configuration component, um, you can put in all kinds of things. There's a blurry line there between what you put in. This is just strings, this is just integers. You can put in whole scripts, actually. You know, like I just want to inject this script into my container so it knows some things more than just Okay, but you said that you guys worked on it, so this yeah. is already on the market. Is it part of the core of Kubernetes uh, yes. development? Since okay. 1. Um, two mm -hmm. three. Now this is 1.3, which has not been, um, the, the final has not been released. It should ah, be released really like around now. So like it's still, it's not, July, it's not in production, it's not in this beta or release in the... Mm -hmm. I think the beta might be out now, <laughs> exactly, like yesterday or tomorrow. And how do you solve the uh, separation of environments? So the yeah. testing environment, acceptance environment, and production All environment? Right. So what we chose, and which is part, you have multiple options to, to run your clusters. And you want to have probably one acceptance mm -hmm. cluster and one production cluster, which is what we chose. Mm -hmm. For all obvious reasons, like uh, you want to be testing uh, out some stuff on your cluster before you take it to production. You don't want to disrupt anything in your production cluster. So Two clusters is the minimum, in my opinion. This is for the YouTube people. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue talking. Oh, there's there. YouTube people there. Okay. <laughs> 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 now now my heart is beating even faster. Public speaker for now. Yeah. <laughs> Getting somewhere here. I recently did that. Um, yeah. So configuration is the thing. You just want to build dumb containers and tell them, like, okay, you're living in this um, environment right now, and the smart thing about Kubernetes is it actually has uh, services which you can look up by, by you know, by DNS, like Consolidus, uh, like uh, Nomad does, and so 
ultimately you don't want you would just want to inject like domain fully qualified domain names for in, to, to, into the containers to tell them like oh here are your dependency endpoints okay I'm an API I want to talk to uh, Mongo or whatever database you have you, you'll just tell it like here's your fully qualified domain name to find your Mongo cluster let's call it just Mongo so this, which is what we did we only had one endpoint so and this actually resolves to a service which will find the right container, which is live. So, and, and which uh, is this continuous integration? Which continuous integration and deployment uh, tools did ah. you use? Well, we, 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 <laughs> we chose workers. So which is kind of like GitLab. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we did. You mean the Dutch Amsterdam uh, startup? Yeah. yeah. Worker, the company. Ah, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I should say Worker. No, no, I don't. Worker. <laughs> <Rager. laughs> um, they they are just like a Travis CI is totally going for the container deployment uh, strategy. So um, they all uh, offer you tools to build the containers, mm. and they all advise you to build like uh, you know lean containers which only have the runnable artifacts, so you don't have uh, any any bloated crap in there that you want to distribute around in your cluster. Um, so one would you advise uh, startup companies like FOB to use? Worker for the missing link? I think um, it comes down to how much money you have to spend. Uh, for now, Worker is for free. They offer you two, two build pipelines uh, con concurrently. That's good. For free. Yeah. Uh, they just announced that they will be asking for money soon. <laughs> and um, looking at the prices they were subscribing, giving you, giving us, it's like, uh, I don't know, so maybe we should go do another, make, make this all happen out in our own on the platform itself. Yeah. So with GitLab you can run on, on, on your cluster. Mm -hmm. So why not run everything on your cluster? Once you have a cluster running, you just download the containers you need and you, like GitLab or whatever well, continues okay, to build Because it, it, it's a, it costs you an awful lot of time to configure it. No. Well, no. <laughs> well yes. Well, well maybe depends. maybe maybe not anymore, but uh, let's say half a year ago stuff was not as mature as this as today. So maybe we should uh, try again. That's, that's uh, maybe one of the solutions. But I didn't have uh, that much uh, success. We started with it. half a year ago. You started half a year ago. The yeah. Yeah. It took us like three months to get it up and running, and now we're just fine. Oh, wait, so stuff. you guys are for Jungo, no? Yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I only recognize it now the name. Jungo. Jungo, Jungo. Yeah. Okay, great, great. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will uh, quickly address some stuff that went wrong, right. and I'm really curious how you felt about that. Um, because. Um, I did, I did make a, a couple of mistakes. <laughs> uh, I tried to put the databases inside containers. And I think you should not do that. And you guys may respond later, but at this point I'm saying don't do that. Because the whole reason why you should do that, why you want to put your containers in a, uh, sorry, why you want to put your database in Docker containers, is so that you can uh, spin them up more easily. But actually, that's not really that hard. You should just type apt-get install Postgres. So maybe just make a, a good uh, document. A good How document. you put data in the container? This is the problem. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Uh, no, no, you, you can. You can of course mount, or you can mount it to a mount point on but your they cluster. Need to di distribute it. Exactly. So that's that's the problem. And and I try to make some kind of an ideal world situation where we have three physical nodes, and on these three physical nodes there were three Docker containers, all having a MySQL or Postgres instance running. And when uh, one of the instances went down. The other two noticed it, and one of them became the master. So you have to think of a whole uh, master-slave uh, promotion stuff, which in in, in a conventional world is doable. But in the uh, you can use uh, build tools for that. Uh, that's not a problem. But in the Kubernetes world, where you don't know where your container is living on which physical node, it was for me at least that's a half year ago. It was not doable, and actually I was thinking, why am I doing this? It doesn't make any sense. Just put the data in a, a separate cluster of two VMs with your database. That's where your state lives. Same holds for storage. And you just uh, look at your Kubernetes cluster <coughs> as a place where you dump all your applications and all your logic happens there. And if it breaks down, not a problem. You just spin it back up really quickly. So that's the, the path that we chose. Um, yeah, I tried to, to mimic Heroku because I thought that's really nice because all my colleagues, they all really enjoy doing Git push and everything magically works. So Deis, maybe some guys have you heard of it, um, is a really awesome tool. It also, it, actually it is a replacement of the whole, whole building process. It is just like another. But then, uh, half year ago it didn't work. <laughs> so maybe if one of you guys want to try again, I think 
this could, this could work, or maybe you should uh, look into Cloud Foundry, it could also work, but a half year ago it didn't work yet. And file replication with Zap, it is a super awesome tool, but uh, there were some problems with the hardware that I was running it. Uh, I had some problems with uh, offset in the clock, and if you have offsets in the clock, <laughs> the, so that's a hardware problem, I know, but I noticed it way back later. Then uh, your cluster all, all of a sudden has these deadlocks, because it's trying to do replication, and it's trying to replicate, replicate, and replicate all over again due to these deadlocks. But that were my experiences. Um, maybe uh, you can do something with that. What did you use the file replication here? Um, parsing. <laughs> Super basic and just it was for for us what we did. We had uh, updates to production not that often, not like every minute, so every ten minutes. So I just scripted with Chrome an R script job that ran every one minute and it just synchronized. And it never failed. It works flawlessly. But I think set should also work closely, but you have, should uh, not be on the cheap hardware. Maybe. <laughs> um, so what were the results? Happy devs? Well, you can ask them. I hope they say that's true. And easy deploy uh, applications, or at least easier. Uh, we did have an increase in smaller apps, which was uh, super awesome, because we now have more smaller services that only have an API instead of bigger monoliths. So that's, that's good. I think that's good. Uh, cost reduction and fail safe infrastructure, uh, also super important for startup. Uh, world. Um, so this is how it looked three weeks ago. Now we'll, I will uh, I'll give back the mic to uh, Wouter because uh, maybe he can tell something uh, where we are standing today uh, and uh, talk uh, a little bit about the challenges that we still have. Um, I'm, I'm seeing you here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have really not a clue what to, what to tell actually. Okay, no, then <laughs> I will just conclude the presentation. Um, <coughs> Like it says, we have some challenges. We, we, uh, we like to, to do uh, some uh, more metrics and we like to do some more logging. At this point, our infrastructure is relatively stupid. So if there are some difficulties about that, uh, please uh, inform me uh, <coughs> now. Yeah. And uh, these are some takeaways, maybe. And you guys are there because I read yeah. your blog post, which was super awesome, so thank you for that. Um, well, this uh, concludes my presentation. Um, if you have any questions about continuous delivery integration using GitLab CI, please uh, come uh, ask me after the, after the talks during the tricks. And if you have any questions, then you could also ask these. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Yes, uh, not so much a question, more of a statement. Is uh, Kelsey Hightower? Yeah. He gave a discussion. He gave a talk yesterday in the oh yeah. hospital, mm -hmm. the um, uh, HashiCorp days, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to talk for an hour about some stuff." He said, "But whatever you do, don't put your database on the stuff because you will lose your data." <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, and, and, "And it's really a smart guy, right?" Yeah. You said that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's from Google, he's from Google Compute Engine, and he said, don't put your database on Kubernetes. You think it'll work, you think it works, you lose your system, you connect up again, it won't work, you will lose your data, don't do it. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, then just hire him. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Just as about a year ago, so. To look at the YouTube video as well, and he will probably maybe recognize me, I, I have to be honest. <laughs> I, I talked to him, yeah. and he advised me uh, when it was actually already too late. But he said, "Don't, don't, don't do that." So um, he, I already spoke to him, and I was like, "Yeah, oops." He's the reason he said that. Yeah. 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 Well, there's two. There's a distinction to be made because uh, I actually made another choice, and because you know, eventually, I think if you want to go containers all the way, uh, you should be treating data endpoints uh, like something magical. They are very, very important in my opinion, of course, because this is where everything lives. You know, you want to keep your state, you want to keep your data. This is the most important thing in your business. You know, everything else is volatile and ephemeral. You can just kick the bucket and, you know, it should come back up. But um, I was thinking about it for a long time and I've been experimenting with this stuff for a long time and ultimately what it does down come, come down to is still the same, the same patterns. You have, you have a, some functionality that wants to dump data. And um, the data needs to be stored somewhere. So you have like a, a need for that data to be stored in, let's say, a high I.O. Uh, environment. You want it to be stored fast, or you want it to be stored in sequen sequentially, yeah. maybe on, on, on tape. You know, so you, have, you still have resource needs. You want to have your data 
and just fit on some, some back end that you chose. And ultimately, if you do it via Mongo or MySQL, it's just functionality that ultimately dumps it on, 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 on disk. So I actually went all the way in. I said, like, okay, let's not treat all that uh, endpoints as something magic. Let's, uh, let's do it. Let's, let's make a cluster of uh, containers, you know, and let's give them uh, those endpoints. Let's give them just those disks. And you actually do get like very stable disks, which you can have backup uh, policies on, where you uh, can be sure of consistency. And you know you can go, you can go back to these to that data all the time. And the, the, the uh, nice thing about it is you have your ecosystem. So you treat it almost the same. You just have one solution to everything. It's like okay, we just build containers, we manage containers, ops guys they just you know make, put containers in the registry. And everything works. And if, if something doesn't work, you have still have the same problem. Because it's functionality, talk to that data on disks. Mm -hmm. And if that's a container or not, it doesn't matter. Still I, I don't agree that you have the same problem. Because the problem gets way, way, way more harder if you have your database, uh, for example, Postgres or MySQL, that lives inside the container. No, 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 it's not. So. I, that's what I'm saying. You're, you have you have disks which yeah. hook up to your containers. So yes, yeah, so you store the container the dies. Data on a volume. No, 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 that I do understand. Yeah. But if there is a problem uh, with the instance or with the mechanism that you program to promote the the one container to be the master or something like that, so if something ah, right. functionality goes wrong, then you have to go. If you first have to find where that Docker container is living, so that's doable. But then you have to log in and, and, and try to fix it. And everything that you fix in configuration files is lost, of course, mm -hmm. the next time that you... Uh, no, no, nothing is different. Nothing is different than from what you... Uh, if you have, like, say, let's say, three VMs, mm -hmm. it, uh, to me it doesn't matter if it's three VMs or three containers. You still have, you have the same logical problems. Okay, and why then... And you know okay. where they are, because, you know, they are a special thing. You know, you have a cluster of, let's say, a couple of containers living somewhere, and you can find them by some good qualified domain name, so... Uh, you don't, you know, you, they are very uh, predictable in nature because you, you chose uh, like a fixed configuration for it. It's not like you know where they live, you know how you want to treat them. It's just you want them to be containerized so you can have them uh, in the same fashion. Let, let's and say you have uh, mm -hmm. MySQL. Yeah. We have three databases, one master, two slaves. Yeah. They are replicating. How do you solve the replication problem? It's just Actually, it's exactly the same if it would be a VM. I just give them two disks. Yeah. So ultimately, logically, they're, they're, they're the same entities. But just the master, the master, master just dies, so I, I just pull the bug yep. in the middle of the transaction. Yep. What happens is that the state on the disk is not uh, correct, right? No, so no, no, no. It's still the same. Like I said, it's, if it's a VM or a container talking to, to its endpoint via I.O., oh, I, I, it's still the same. Maybe, um, maybe, uh, <laughs> 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 no, but I, I feel like you kind of have a problem with the documentation and debugging these things. Just being data being stored somewhere, and if, 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 if for some in, if some reason there's um, like a hiccup, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, get, you can get data and consistency, but the same it happens with the VM. It's like it's, you still have the same logical no, problems. No, because in the VM, uh, so my proposal is to have two databases. This one goes down, and this uh, is continuously doing MySQL database replication. So, configure it to MySQL, not using this, just MySQL replication. This one goes down, this one promotes to being the master, and you just spin up a new one, and it gets the data from this one. Let's put it the other way around. You, mm -hmm. you're, you're talking now about a solution. Yeah. Some solution, maybe you came up with it or somebody else, mm -hmm. but that solution can be, in, can be implemented the same way with containers. That's my point. Yeah, that I, that I agree with, but I, I say it's more difficult to find a problem if you have a problem. No, 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 that's, that's the statement you make. But I disagree with the statement. That's a matter of monitoring and, you know, making, making sense. You of have beer here as a habit. Stage. So when you both have beers, <laughs> <laughs> then it makes Are there any questions? Yeah, questions, questions, over there. questions please. Um, uh, what I was going to ask is a really simple database question. I, just, I mean, I mean, as a DBA, I'm always interested in containers, and I hear about you can containerize your database, and I completely understand about the hard case being around recovery, uh, and this is why everyone's saying don't do it, as far as I can tell. But what I was really, what I was back, I mean, and that was a very interesting discussion you had there, uh, what I really wanted to ask is actually, why did you use Postgres as opposed to MySQL? Uh, was there any particular reason? Why did you use Postgres? Uh, as opposed to MySQL, which is probably the more popular open source database yes. engine. Yeah, true that. Uh, two reasons. Uh, one reason is we have multi-tenant applications, and in Postgres you can uh, specify different schemes, schemas. No, not schemas. Is that the correct word? 
Yeah, yeah. Three, yeah. 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 For, for your different tenants, so yeah. that makes uh, errors in your software, um, makes it less likely that errors in your software propagate to the data layer. So that's one, that's not okay. in MySQL. So MySQL, I mean, I'm, I'm an Oracle Postgres DBA, so I'm just, I don't know that much about MySQL. MySQL can't do that. So you have uh, tables, but within mm -hmm. the table, there are no different roles or schemes you can use. So in Postgres, okay. you have a table and you have schemes for all the customers that we have. So that's multi-tenancy implemented uh, right, I think. Yeah, and then MySQL is more I'm just surprised that MySQL couldn't do it. Okay, that was the first reason, which is interesting. But what was the second one? Uh, HMAPS, is it called? Yeah, it's just JSON, storing JSON files is yeah. really easy. Oh, uh, yeah, that's quite nice in Postgres. Yeah, yeah it works really, really well. well. Okay. And I think geospatial is. Yeah, we tried think to do a demo. MySQL has geospatial. Okay, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. But, uh, even as good as Postgres, you know? Uh, I d that's more application level than me, than I am. I'm more infrastructure. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I was just curious about why you chose Postgres. But there is no good answer. You could also use MySQL. I think there's another opinion. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> let, me take, let me take the interesting thing about this discussion because now we're just talking about I like this solution better than the other. Wow. But uh, on the infrastructure level, uh, with, with regard to this presentation, the Kubernetes, the interesting part about this is actually um, that you can use. Um, oh, fuck, I almost lost it. Wait a second. <laughs> I was thinking, thinking about it. It's a very important thing. But um, it's not. It's, it's not. Um, Oh, what were we talking about again? Yeah, yeah, I know. Are going to talk about containerized Okay. The multi-tenancy part. Yeah. So this is this is interesting actually because if you run a pass like this, it is. You know, you run your own cluster. You can with Kubernetes, you can create like a pod, a pod, and a pod is actually like a logical entity in which you can group functionality. You can create a pod. Per, per tenant. You yeah, chose to true. have one that's endpoint and, and have, a, have a logical distinction yeah. per tenant in your endpoint. That's but true. you could have multiple endpoints per, per Of course. And they would, would be that. totally shielded. And they would be totally like audit, audit like, you know. Yeah, but you also want to have some shared data actually between them. Ah, but then you can have a shared service that they can access. Sounds complicated. Puristically speaking. I mean, that sounds great, but you'd have to be confident that you could, ta could containerize your database, because I'm sure maybe the future, but everyone's saying don't do it now. So, yeah. Not you everyone. No, it's been done. I've been doing quite a few Kubernetes right. right. printers yeah. yeah. where people say that. I mean, I, this really isn't my area of expertise. But, um, yeah. You have, I, have, I have a question. I, some of those words are very, very new for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the CI, CD guru in my company, he's been talking about something called Spinnaker from Netflix. Yeah. Is that a kind of a similar kind of a solution for containerized deployments? Sorry, I uh, I cannot answer that. I did okay. I did hear about Spinnaker. Okay. I did quickly read, read that page, but I have no idea. Uh, who, who made it? Actually, doesn't use uh, Netflix. Uh, Netflix and Spinnaker and Google. Spinnaker and Google. <laughs> Yeah, Spinnaker well, is basically the functionality, not nothing. Okay, yeah, Spinnaker is basically just an uh, orchest um, orchestration tool above Jenkin Jenkins. Okay. So you do your Jenkins build, and then Jenkins triggers Spinnaker, and Spinnaker decides: uh, Do I need to deploy it to this da data center or to this data center? Ah, okay. Well, well not completely a provisioning tool, but it's an orchestration oh, orchestration tool, tool uh, above other tools. So something different than the Kubernetes. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, I do. Uh, I have a question for the both of you, actually. Uh, since you have both implemented Kubernetes, uh, did you implement Kubernetes on premise in your own hardware, or did you use the cloud solutions, Google Compute Engine, Amazon, whatever? Good question. I, uh, we did not do it on premise, and we also did not use the standard install Kubernetes for me script thingy stuff that right. Google has. But I installed it on these low, uh, low cost uh, uh, cloud providers like. Uh, DigitOcean, uh, Linode, uh, OVH in France, so cheap, cheap, cheap. And you did, you did the installation manual? Well, uh, CordOS is, uh, no, actually not. CordOS is built uh, on top of, sorry, Kubernetes. You, you used the HyperCube image, probably. And no, so CordOS, and I can yeah. just, with Terraform, I can start launching servers on all these uh, beta providers, that right. these cloud providers that I mentioned. And they just spin up a CordOS instance, and that's it. Right, so then you have CoreOS. So now, how would you start the Cube API and the Cube Proxy? And uh, I built a Terraform script right. that, that does that. So I can just with one press 
from the enter button. Uh, and it does stuff, and then five minutes later, you uh, it, will, it will provision those for you. Yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a multi level thing. Right. You have the infrastructure, which is done with Terraform. So you get up all the way to the core OS instances, including the, the user data. So it boots uh, properly with all the services that right. you want to start off with. And then you still have to provision it. You have to provision it with, with, the, with the Kubernetes, let's say, empty. It's an empty yeah. thing, you know, like it has its base system um, containers running, uh, let's say DNS, um, some, some proxies, and then you want to apply your right. application, which you can automate as well. You can just you know, have the whole infra, get up, whenever you deploy, you can right. up, up, reapply these scripts and see what. Okay, Terraform. So, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Question about the data stuff, because I assume that you probably would need a relational database, that's why you even talk progress or MySQL, but then if you look to something like Cassandra or Cloudland. Yeah, yeah, good question. We actually we used a, a couple of data stores in uh, Combi, in, in the Combi uh, infrastructure. We use Refig database, that's a NoSQL database. Yeah. It's probably less known, but it is, you can compare it with Mongo, but then easier to manage, at least that's my opinion again. Uh, so that's NoSQL. I didn't look into Cassandra or any distributed, uh, distributed uh, database services, yeah. which uh, could have been a good idea. Yeah. However, we are using the active record uh, part of uh, Rails, which can, which is a DSL for uh, MySQL Postgres, etc. Ah, yeah, so that's why. Actually, yeah. that's why. Yeah. You have to think that everything that you try to achieve needs to be done quick, quick, quick. quick, yeah. quick. So that there are way more elegant and, and super distributed solutions, but I think that if you start here as a, as a startup company, yeah. then you can uh, use all the magic. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. David. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, enjoyed the talk, but I really did miss the part about testing, yeah. <laughs> debugging, log yeah. aggregation, monitoring. Um, yeah, what do you guys can say about that? Uh, no, no, you're right, yeah, these, these are the challenges. So implementation of Prometheus <laughs> and Elastic, that is logging. Mm -hmm. Testing at, at Combi, as you're probably aware of, are, uh, is not our main expertise, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, so, uh, so yes, you're totally right. We uh, we did implement a few integration tests on the end because it's called uh, API, so you can just test the API endpoint. Uh, and that should be part of your continuous integration and deployment uh, phase. In GitLab CI, it is possible, and for two projects we implemented it as well. So you first have a test phase, then a Docker image is built. The code is put into the Docker image, and then in that Docker, sorry, then it's a container, in that Docker container, uh, the tests are run, mm -hmm. so then we did it. Um, what was the other thing that you missed? Debugging. Mm -hmm. Debugging, yeah, that's, I stick to what I said before, debugging is difficult, more difficult at least, inside a, a Docker container than it used to be in the conventional uh, services. Uh, the, the, the thing about cloud uh, cluster computing is that, of course, that you want to have a, a log streams, yeah. As soon as possible, yeah. you want to go to a centralized view of your logging of all your containers and make sense of it on that level, um, which you can do with Kibana and Elastic, which is what we are using right now. Um, we're using actually two two endpoints for storage for log streams. We also use a, a cloud-hosted solution, which gives us a one-day retention for free. Which one? Which is uh, uh, I actually use. Um, no, no, we don't use Logia. We use a, a solution of some technical guys. Who no, it doesn't matter. Three, three around there. We're lucky you can <laughs> use. Or, or there's, there's many many of these storage endpoints which you can use. And, um, so choose one and go with it and to feel it. You see how it feels. But the point is you want to have that one centralized view where you can you know, have a filter where you can go like, okay, I want to track these, these two, two containers. I don't <laughs> see anything else right now. I can <laughs> zoom in on this bit. And then we would like ultimately maybe have like uh, one that correlates with, 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 the, with your system uh, metrics. So. You know, you, you see like Mr. System Metrics Pack, you see something failing, you would like to be, click, be able to click on it, and then it opens up the logs underneath, like from that, from that, from that same time period, you know, so you can just know yeah. exactly what's going on. You don't want to have to fiddle around all the time with twits and ups and go from that application to that application. Um, they, I used a data doc for a while, yep. but now it's, uh, it's super Air pricey, but mm -hmm. it used to be free. Okay. And, and there's in a battle between application performance management. Which one would you guys go for? New Relic, Datadog, something very simple, CloudWatch. What what is your? I I don't I don't care much. Um, it depends on what your flavor is. 
-hmm. and your money to spend. And your money to spend. Yeah. Uh, data dog is more. Is, is you can you can most of these things actually come out of the box with a lot of um, integration uh, tools. You would have to open up your application actually and inject something there mm -hmm. to make it put it out in that for that context for that view. I'm totally against that. You know mm -hmm. why? Because Docker actually just talks to standard in, standard and standard er, standard out, mm -hmm. and it just collects that. You don't need anything. You don't need to plug in any plugins to tell them like, oh, log over there, log over there. No, just standard standard er and standard out. They get logged. Mm -hmm. and they get they get put in this in that stream. Right, mm -hmm. and if you have good, good log output, which you create yourself, which you have control over yourself, you mm -hmm. can actually, uh, you know, with the, the standard Node.js, let's say debug. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows the debug package. It's, uh, well, it's used. terrible. Use Bunyan if you ever want to log in. No, no, no. Bunyan is the same point. Bunyan tells you to, to go log somewhere else. No, you want to go to standard or standard, <laughs> and standard, standard out. You just want to have same logging output, which has like strings where you can mm -hmm. grab on. So that's but the point. You can <laughs> pipe uh, Bunyan to STD out. That's the whole point. Make it simple, actually. Docker makes it simple. Yes. Yeah. It is all already all already in there, so you don't need all the fancy schmancy. You, you, yeah. You want one centralized solution that's actually the same for everything. That's m that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. They all have a lot of eye candy, and they all tell you like, okay, you have to go into your application, you have to. Plug in, jack, jack this in, jack that yeah. in over there. You don't want to rewire anything. You just want it to work as is, and that's the nice thing about Docker. Just capture what's coming out of these streams. And wait, wait. Then maybe one last thing, and then we are going for beers. How do you do your log rotate? That's the point. Let it, let that, yeah, let that be handled by those endpoints. <laughs> they specialize no, no, in that. No, 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 I mean on the, on the host. So if you do the what you what you are suggesting, which is in my opinion a good idea, then the Docker host is receiving all these standard errors and these standard outs uh, and then you can then propagate that back to somewhere Core OS yeah. already auto-rotates uh, auto -rotates all these logs for you, I believe and uh, if, if it doesn't, I, I don't have a problem with logs <laughs> because our Core OS logs rotates my logs I don't know and, 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 and it sends it out to, to my endpoints, so that's the point okay. the endpoints have your data, you don't want it on these machines you, don't, you, don't want, you want it off these machines as soon as possible the logging doesn't exist there, you don't want it to exist there it's ephemer ephemeral machines and everything you don't want to inspect <coughs> Endpoint that's also that's also that's also but uh, maybe check before you uh, <laughs> before you say yeah 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 CoreOS does that for you because uh, maybe at this point it does but a half year ago it did not. Well, so with then with you, you fill up your hard disk and then it fails. With Docker 1.9 or higher, you can uh, configure the the, the logger. Yeah, you can configure where the logs should be pushed to yeah. in the Docker daemon, so there are no files stored locally. Super, awesome yeah. tip. Yeah, you can uh, use the long volume or something else, somewhere else in Docker. So when it spills, it's just somewhere else. Yeah, and uh, Great. I was lazy, so I didn't do that. So <laughs> super cool. yeah, you'll be all right. Yeah, you, sh you should do that. Getting more. Cool. Okay. Getting more, yeah. Uh, guys, so I think it's can I, time can I for more? Yeah, you can. Yeah. I want to have one, one, one more thing to say. <laughs> one bonus. Oh. oh, you just had like this slide where it said like thanks for the about the um, yeah yeah yeah. The oh, you want the Decker there? <laughs> if you go to that, well, go in full stack with Django and Kubernetes. I, I actually published our stack. I stripped it from everything that is relevant. That of course you know. No secrets from, from no us. No secrets <laughs> from us to be found <laughs> in there. <laughs> but you can just um, if you find see some how we do it. <laughs> and, oh, and you can just boot it up, and you can just and it will it will run. It's infrastructure as code. You can just start it up, and you know follow the follow the manual, which has something. <laughs> 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 RTFM, yeah. But it's more or less like three steps. Like you boot up the infra, you say start to Kubernetes, which deploys all the apps, and then you know yeah. actually that's that's more or less it. Cool. You, you have to configure something. <laughs> Awesome, Thanks.